Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, so hello and welcome everybody. I, I'm assuming actually a few more will probably be joining in the next few minutes, but we're going to get started um, since time is always limited. Um, but I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, my name is Rabbi Nikki Greninger. I am the Director of Lifelong Learning at Temple Isaiah in Lafayette, uh, California, which is in the Bay Area. And I'm uh, just starting my 15th year here. Uh, for those who are just joining us, it would be great if you can um, change your Zoom name so that it has the city that you're coming to us from, just since we're all over the place. It'll help us situate ourselves. Um, so welcome, welcome to those of you that just joined. And I want to say a big thank you to Nahama uh, Moskowitz for setting this up and uh, organizing and uh, planning these series of Onward Hebrew webinars. Uh, hopefully they've been helpful to, to many around the country. Um, so welcome. We are going to um, get started. And as we do, uh, we want to um, encourage you. Yes, Did somebody just jump in. Oh, well, we want to encourage you um, as we're going through everything today to, um, if you can, have a piece of paper or a pen off to the side and that you might want to um, note down for yourself as you hear different things. Um, from what you hear, what do you think you might start doing after today? What do you think you might stop doing? And what are you thinking about? Um, just things or things to think about after today. Um, just a way for you to keep some notes that maybe will be helpful for you after today. Um, those who just joined, welcome. Um, if you can put your name in your Zoom um, name along with the city that you're coming from, that would be great. Um, so in one case, we have Los Angeles, but we lost your name. So <laughs> if you can add your name, that would be great. Um, so uh, so for, for your own note-taking purposes uh, today, what will you start doing? What will you stop doing? And what do you want to think about after today? Um, so, setting that aside for the moment, we're going to start with a little poll just to get our juices flowing. Um, our webinar today is all about decoding and um, how do we teach decoding and how do we think about that in the framework of Onward Hebrew and this approach to Hebrew, Hebrew learning. So, we're going to start with a little poll. I'm going to put it in the chat. It's using um, something called Mentimeter. So, you can um, open up the link and hopefully it will take you to um, fill out the poll. So go ahead um, and we'll wait for the results and then we'll share the results. Oh, hold on. I don't know why. Oh, it's doing one at a time. Sorry, I didn't know that it set that way. One second. So fill out the first one and I'm going to put it up on the screen. Do I have the ability to share my screen, Nahama? I think I do. Okay, I do. Uh, no, um, Nahama, I need you to please make me a co-host. Thank you. Welcome to those that just joined. We are um, filling out a little poll at the moment. And I'm going to show you the screen, and then we'll go to the next one. Can you all see this now? Yes. OK. So um, this is the results of this group here of what size groups you use for teaching decoding. Great. OK. Now we're going to go to, hold on, how do I go to the next one? Sorry, this is a little bit of a new technology for me. Let me see if I can go to the next question. Uh, hold on. Ah, OK. We're on to the next question. So go ahead. You can now fill out the poll. I think it's the same link, hopefully, on your page. But I'm going to share my screen because I think as results come in, you will see them. So one second. Okay, so this is at what grade level do students usually learn to decode? And here we mean actually sound out letters and vowels and put them all together. So, um, and we realize it might be a little different kid to kid, but you know, usually in your setting, what's typical? All right. All right, I think. We've got most everybody. Welcome to those that just joined. We're happy to have you. If you can um, change your Zoom name just to add in where you're coming from, it gives us a context of where everyone is. That would be great. 
And uh, there is a link in the chat to the poll that we're doing. So um, at what grade level do students usually learn to decode? It looks like in this group, it's mostly third grade and then with you know a smattering in fourth and beyond, and in one case, um, younger than third grade. All right, we're gonna go to the next slide. So this poll question is, is there some sort of test to find in your setting to find out if students are ready for B'nai Mitzvah or B'nai Mitzvah preparation. So, you know, is there a written test, an oral test of some sort? Is it done in class? Is it with a clergy person? And this is just a, you type in whatever you want to type in because we know it might be different place to place. Um, you know, if there's some, at what point or how is there some sort of um, check-in test type of a thing? Out of curiosity. We'll wait a minute as people fill this out. We've got, we've got mostly no's at this point. No's are not sure's. We have some reports from Hebrew instructors. There is an assessment with the B'nai Mitzvah coordinator determined by the tutor. Uh, no formal assessment. Sometimes a, an educator or rabbi does an assessment. Oral test at the end of fifth grade and sixth grade in class with the with an educator. Okay. All right. I think we'll go to the next question. So this question is: um, If in your setting students are required to learn prayers, perhaps for bar bat mitzvah, um, how many prayers do they have to learn? And you may not know exactly, but estimate. You know, zero to five, six to ten, eleven to fifteen. We'll uh, see what these results are as people share. And uh, welcome to those that just joined. We're doing a quick little poll to get us started. So uh, the question is, how many prayers do, stu do students have to learn in your, in your setting? Looks like so far almost everyone is in the 6 to 10 range. Now, I, th I don't think you can go back and re-enter the poll, but when Nahama and I were talking about this, um, I, I added in, you know, what if we added the words um, that they have to learn to decode? Like, would that change your answer or would that actually be the same? Because I actually didn't include that in the question. This is more just how many do they have to learn? Like, do they have to know? Maybe that's, they sing them, they lead them. But if we said they have to, you know, sort of prove their decoding skills with their prayers, then, you know, would that change your answer? Um, if you have any thoughts on that, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Uh, and we're going to go on to the next um, the next question here. Um, do you or your teachers use a sound to print approach to teach decoding? And if you don't know what that is, that's OK. That There's a not sure category, which might be I don't know. Um, so yes, no, thinking about it, not sure. It also might be some yes, some no. I realize we don't have that uh, that answer here. All right. Looks like we've got uh, some some a, a fair amount of not sures. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later today, and some yeses, not yet, a little bit of no. All right. Okay. I think we will um, stop this poll. All right. So we hope that this just kind of got the juices flowing a little bit about decoding, teaching decoding, what some of the possibilities are, what it might look like in your setting. Um, welcome to those that have joined uh, recently. We're happy to have you. Um, and if you can add your location into your Zoom name, uh, that would be great. We are um, talking today about decoding um, in part because I think probably on some level all of us uh, have had some experience with what I'll call the traditional system of teaching decoding not really working or not working very well. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why it doesn't work very well. One reason is just over the years, there's less time for Jewish education. You know, 50, 60, 70 years ago in some settings, there were many more hours per week or days per week. Um, in many of our settings, there's just not a lot of time. Um, there's also the major, major challenge of absences. I would say that's the number one biggest challenge with teaching decoding is that, 
uh, it, I'll, I'll say inconsistent attendance. If half the class isn't there and you're teaching a bet and the next let week you're teaching Gimel and a different half of the class or third of the class isn't there, then, you know, by week three, some of them know bet and some know Gimel and some know both and some don't know either one because they actually missed both weeks. So inconsistent attendance is very, very challenging in our settings. Um, some of the other reasons that the kind of traditional ways that we teach decoding don't work is that um, it puts pressure on kids in ways that is uh, challenging for them because it's not really uh, brain-based in terms of the way we do it. And we'll, we'll talk a little more about that with the sound to print approach. Um, also, it's really hard uh, to learn Hebrew decoding because of the nature of how Hebrew letters work. Um, in English, a lot of the letters look the same no matter which way you turn them. It's still the same letter. The only exception to that we have is B, P, D, and Q which are actually the same shape, but sort of turned in different directions. Um, but there's a lot of that in Hebrew. And so it's, uh, it's just a, a harder and different type of thing to recognize the symbols. Another challenge is lack of motivation. Um, you know, not every third grader is all that interested in learning how to decode in a different language. Um, uh, I wanna um, also clarify that um, when we're talking about decoding, what we're talking about is recognizing these little symbols on the page and sounding them out. But that skill by itself is also historically not a very valuable skill in life and in most societies. Um, what really is the valuable skill is reading. And what reading is, is sort of this process of decoding, of recognizing symbols on the page and putting them together into sounds. But when they come into sounds, they have meaning. You know, so you sound out something like C-A-T and you're like, cat, cat, oh, cat, like, yes. So that skill of reading is a, certain things happen in the brain that when you're sounding out things that sound like nonsense, that, that it doesn't work the same way in the brain. It doesn't have that same recognition. It doesn't have that same um, outcome. So decoding is actually much, much harder to do because there's no clues as to whether you're right or you're wrong. Whereas if you're really reading, you do actually know if it sounds right or it sounds wrong or it's a word you know, et cetera. Um, we also have a, a real false assumption that if kids can read in English, or whatever other language, um, Spanish, et cetera, that they should be able to read in Hebrew, which I think is actually why historically many religious schools um, taught Hebrew starting in third grade, because third grade is the year that uh, in a typically developing child, kids go from learning to read to reading to learn, like in their native language, so in English in our, in our area. Um, so we assume, well, now that they can read this one language, they're ready to start reading this other language. Um, but just because you can read one language doesn't mean you're automatically primed for the next one. There's other kinds of priming that's, that's needed. Um, the other thing I, I want to mention, and then we're going to get to um, some other pieces, is that if the skill that we're teaching is decoding to sound out unfamiliar um, text and be able to sound it out, that skill is actually not very helpful for participating in tefillah, in prayer, because the, the speed with which we pray is way faster than most people can decode if they're, especially if they're newer decoders, and especially if they're not reading, like they don't really know what it means, they don't know what the sounds are already supposed to be, then just sounding it out is um, gonna be way, way slower than what we do in synagogue. So that is, um, the one doesn't necessarily lead to the other, meaning being able to decode does not necessarily enable you to pray with community, um, at least not initially, um, because it's just too fast. So I want to point out that, you know, prior to the printing press, all of prayer was done auditorily, like somebody's leading and everybody's listening. And yes, maybe the leader had something printed or written, um, although even the idea of a prayer book is fairly late in Jewish history. I think some of our earliest prayer books are from around the 10th century or so. Um, but even still, it was often maybe only the leader who had something in front of them and everybody else just participates by hearing and singing along as, you know, as is needed. Um, and so this idea that you actually have to read Hebrew in order to be a prayer is actually like not in line with Jewish history. Um, and uh, the other thing to add is that the mass production of Sidurim in the United States didn't happen until the 1860s. So even though there was the printing press 200 years before that, a couple hundred years, maybe more. Um, the, the idea that everybody is sitting together with the words in front of them, with a prayer book, and everybody's following along in a visual way is actually very, very late in our history and um, tradition. So those two things being directly tied together, is um, does, it doesn't always have to be that way. So um, I see some things in the chat. 
um, ah, um, sight words versus decoding. Um, maybe we'll get to that other than I will say that a sight word is recognizing on sight, right, a whole word. Um, in some ways you could say it's a form of decoding, but I would say that usually a sight word is closer to reading because there's an expectation of what the word is. So you see the whole thing and you know what the whole thing is as opposed to sounding out sound by sound by sound. Um, they're just two different ways to um, learn readings. I mean, there's a huge um, conversation and debate in uh, uh, the literature about how people learn to read, about whether you should teach by sight words or by phonetics or both and which order. and we're not going to spend too much time on that today, other than to say that in any case, when we're outside of our Hebrew conversation, like if we were talking with teachers who are teaching reading at, you know, a, a whatever, regular non-Jewish school, um, the conversation is still about reading. It's about phonetics versus sight words and how you get them to read. It's not about just sounding out things that they don't understand or don't know what it is they're supposed to be reading. So um, we're going to take a very brief um, three, four minutes for um, very short breakout rooms just for um, introductions and a very brief reflection. So um, it's going to be three minutes. So introduce yourself. And the question that we want you to share with the people that you're meeting is, um, to what extent do you currently feel successful with teaching decoding? Um, and or, if you would rather answer a different question, what made you decide to sign up for this workshop? So either of those two things, to what extent do you feel successful with teaching decoding? and or what made you decide to sign up. Um, there will be a, a couple of you in the room. You only have three minutes, so try to keep it fairly short, and then we'll come back as a group. So see you soon, and uh, we'll meet We'll meet each other. Okay, they're in there in a green Okay, and we can pause decoding or um, recording, not decoding. Welcome back. Um, person who spells a name X A N I, I've always wondered how to pronounce that. What is it? Zani. Zani? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, well, we have some other. Oh, here comes oh, everybody. Like boom, boom, boom. They're back. <laughs> All right, welcome back. The uh, the joy and the frustration of being cut off by the by the Zoom breakout room, shooting you back to the main the main room. All right. Well, um, we're gonna spend the next maybe twenty minutes or so. Um, with both Nahama and I sharing some different um, pieces around decoding, and then we'll move more into a Q&A and discussion. So as you have questions and thoughts that come up, um, please feel free to jot them down for yourself, um, but then we'll, we'll kind of come to them in about 20 minutes or so. Um, so I want to share just a little bit of my um, journey and experience with this and um, some of what I see in my congregation. Um, I think I shared at the beginning You're muted. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I introduced myself at the beginning, but um, I'll do so again since we had some folks join us. Um, so I am um, Nikki Greninger. I'm a rabbi and the director of lifelong learning at Temple Isaiah in Lafayette, California, in the Bay Area. I am starting my 15th year at Temple Isaiah. And uh, I'll just share briefly my own sort of journey and experience with um, this topic of teaching decoding. Uh, hopefully it will be helpful. Uh, when I came to my congregation, I was following an educator who was fabulous. Um, and there was a really strong education program at this congregation. Um, but when I was looking at everything that was happening and where we might kind of, you know, take things to the next level, it felt to me like Hebrew was the piece that really wasn't working. And that basically every grade, every year, the kids were learning how to decode. And they were just doing it with a different publisher's materials each year. So like one year they were doing decoding with, you know, Berman House materials, and the next year it was Torah Ora, and the next year it was Sarah and David. And it was like a smattering of different materials, but there was never any progression, really, um, for all the reasons we started this webinar talking about. And so I wanted to make change, and I 
first um, went into um, a path of adopting Meet Kadem, which was a curriculum that was meant to be self-paced. I was really excited by it because I thought, well, that way the kids who are there regularly can move ahead and the other kids who barely show up can kind of go at their pace. So I was very energized by that. And we adopted that and did that for about two or three years. And the first year it worked pretty well. The second year it did not go so well. And by the third year it was pretty much a disaster. Um, because to be honest, the kids just weren't that motivated, most of them. Like they didn't really care if they were moving ahead or how fast. Um, it was logistically complicated. There were a number of other reasons. But what I realized is that a self-paced approach wasn't really um, going to work with what we were trying to do. So at that time, we ended up launching a Hebrew task force. It was a two-year process of reimagining how we teach Hebrew. And at the end of it, we decided to create a, um, a Hebrew boot camp for our students to learn decoding in a one-on-one -on -one way with a mentor uh, for an hour a week for 12 weeks. Uh, and we were using the Let's Learn Hebrew side-by-side -side program. And we integrated it during our religious school hours. Um, the program I run is called JQuest. So during JQuest, they would sort of instead of being in a group, they would be one-on-one -on -one with a volunteer mentor and they would learn how to decode. And we discovered that the one-on-one -on -one aspect of it was great, but the way we had set it up structurally was also sort of a disaster. Um, that the kids just, as we all know, they're not super consistent. So they wouldn't show up sometimes or they were late or they had to leave early or whatever. And we had these volunteer mentors waiting to help them and then kids not showing up. And we had also structured it that it was during sixth grade, so we needed them to finish by a certain date so that the next group of kids could come and do this program. And that just didn't work. And so a, a couple months into it, we said, you know what, we're pulling this completely out of our JQuest setting, of our religious school setting. And we ended up creating a Hebrew boot camp that is separate and in addition to JQuest, uh, kind of like we do for B'nai Mitzvah tutoring. So basically, they do this uh, Hebrew boot camp for um, an hour a week with a, a mentor uh, for about 12 weeks, and then they uh, transition into their B'nai Mitzvah tutoring. Uh, we, by doing that, they think of it more as B'nai Mitzvah tutoring, so it feels more kind of, I'll say, important to them. And also, it's not during the regular JQuest hours, so it's a time that they have arranged with the parents and the person and whatever. And so it's, um, it's just more consistent, and that's worked much better. Um, so what I want to say in my years of experience um, doing this, and that was, just for some context, that was in 2013, I think, or 2014 maybe. So this has been at least eight or so years, eight or nine years that we've been doing this approach. Um, and our kids have been really successful in learning decoding. And I think one of the reasons for it is the one-on-one -on -one experience of learning because the person working with them sees what they're getting, what they're not getting, can focus more on the parts they're not getting. If there's a kid who learns it really quickly, they can move along really quickly. They don't have to sit around extremely bored while everybody else is struggling. Or a kid who really is struggling and needs to go slowly and take more time can do that and take more time. It also took it out of the group setting during JQuest so that we don't have you know three or four or five or 10 kids sitting around you know, bored out of their minds while some other kid is trying to sound out uv shoch b'cha or whatever. Um, so I think that it was, um, for us, it's been really successful in both um, the actual decoding learning experience has been much more positive, but the experience for the rest of the kids has also been more positive because the process of learning how to read or how to decode either way is, is slow and laborious and um, we don't have that much time with them, so we don't want a huge amount of their time to be sitting around kind of waiting for others to, to be working on this. So I think the one-on-one -on -one model has been um, really successful. We have started, um, when we changed our approach to Hebrew, we started surveying the kids at the end of every year in a kind of a student survey um, of grades three through six, asking them about their Hebrew learning. Um, and the three things that we were trying to measure were um, confidence, competence, and attitude. So attitude is like, do they like it? Do they not like it? How do they feel? Is it you know, positive, negative? Uh, confidence is a little bit different, which is how good at it do you think you are? Um, and the third thing is competence. Like, can they actually, you know, sound out the Hebrew? Can they participate in prayers, etc.? And what we found in um, collecting that data over years is that our, the attitudes about Hebrew are really positive. Um, it's not 100%. They don't all love Hebrew. Um, but what we've found fairly consistently over the years that we've been doing this approach is that about 80% of the kids feel positively about their Hebrew learning. And about 20% or so have negative things to say. So, you know, it's not 100%. But I, 
I regret that we don't have any data from before we made the change. So I don't have very good baseline data. But at least anecdotally from what I saw and what I feel like I heard is that I think it was probably the reverse. I think probably about 80% had more negative feelings about Hebrew and about 20% you know, had positive feelings. Or at least when I look back on our Meet Kadem years, that's kind of... Uh, the impression that I get that a you know a percentage of them liked it and were into it and felt good about it and a lot of them did not. Um, so it feels like from the attitude perspective, it's um, been really successful. The um, confidence piece also, um, the students are largely very confident. They don't think it's that hard, um, and this also has to do with. Um, all the other pieces of Onward Hebrew, which we're not talking as, about as much today. And in a minute, um, Nahama will talk about the sound to print approach. But in general, I would say our students learn Hebrew from very young ages, but they're learning it more in oral and auditory ways. And so, and through movement, with Hebrew through movement and through prayer and all of these different um, modalities. So by the time they learn to decode, which in my community is about a year before their bar and bat mitzvah, we find that they don't think it's very hard. It doesn't take that long. They have all this learning underneath it that scaffolds it. So when they're actually learning the decoding, it is largely reading in the sense that they know what a lot of the words mean. Or even if they don't know the meaning of every word, like in, for example, in prayers, uh, prayer Hebrew is pretty high level Hebrew. Um, so I don't think it's reasonable to expect them to understand every word. Um, but they know what the word should sound like because they're used to singing it all the time when we do tefillah. And so they, ha they do have that recognition of like, oh, that's the right word. Like that sounds right. Um, and so it becomes more of those light bulb moments of it feeling successful. So I think that improves their confidence as well. Um, I want to say two other brief notes before I'm going to turn it over to Nahama to talk a little bit about sound to print. Um, some of you have heard me say this before, um, but I'm a big fan of transliteration, and I know that that puts me as an outlier in some Jewish education circles. Um, but I feel really strongly that transliteration is a tool that enables us to participate in prayer. It's the reason most of us have synagogues with prayer books with transliteration in it is because if you're coming to synagogue and you can't read Hebrew fast enough to participate in the prayers, we use the English letters as a way to know what the words are supposed to sound like, and it helps us to pray. Um, and as I said before, prayer doesn't have to be a reading exercise. Prayer can be, you know, it's words that are memorized, or as uh, my colleague uh, Rabbi Stacy Regler says, if they're in your heart, like why is it so bad that the prayers are in your heart if you've memorized it by heart? Um, so whether it's, it's sort of memorized or it's more just that it's familiar and you're kind of following along or you use transliteration as a tool, to me those are all gateways into prayer. So decoding is still a, a skill we want our students to learn, um, but to me it's not the defining skill for being able to participate in prayer. So I find transliteration to be very useful in helping them know what it's supposed to sound like. It's like um, when you have a little kid and you read them good night moon over and over again, like a baby, by the time they get old enough to recognize letters and words, and then they can read it because they're like, they know what the word's supposed to be already. But then they can actually read it and that's really exciting. So our students have that experience because they know the prayers already, both by ear and with transliteration. But then the Hebrew adds another layer of ability and it's so exciting to them that now they really can follow along in the Hebrew. The last thing I want to say um, before uh, pausing and turning it to Nahama is that um, there's been obviously a big shift in the last few years with a lot more online learning, um, you know, switching over to Zoom or other platforms uh, because of COVID. Um, and I know that there are many synagogues that had a, had a lot of success with Hebrew learning online. And I have heard of many synagogues who have said, you know, we're not going back, like we're going to keep Hebrew online or midweek Hebrew or whatever. Um, and I want to acknowledge that that might work for some. I also want to say we found in my community that it did not work for us, um, that even in a one-on-one -on -one platform, which we're using for teaching decoding, uh, what we were finding is that our students were getting to bar and bat mitzvah with far um, weaker Hebrew decoding or reading skills. Um, and uh, when my cantor and I were talking about, you know, is it is it our whole approach? Is it this program? What is it that's leading our kids to not be as successful at the Hebrew decoding piece? We feel that the big turning point was when they moved to an online sort of option um, that they don't pay attention as much. Who knows how many other screens they have open? They're just not as engaged and not as focused. And so we have actually now um, in this latest phase of COVID moved to a model of 
going back to requiring them to be in person unless if they really want to try online, we will give it a couple weeks as a trial and see if they're able to really get it and get it well. And after a few weeks, if it's not progressing in the way that we think that it should, then they have to come back in person. Um, even though our program is computer-based and they sit with an adult one-on-one -on, -one on the computer, it still has been a really big difference to be sitting in person with another human being. So again, I want to acknowledge that may not be true everywhere, but I do think that it's a different learning experience when you're sitting at home online versus you know face-to-face -face with somebody else. And we've just found that in our community that the learning decoding has been more effective in person. So I'm going to pause, turn it over to Nahama. All right. And I'm putting into the um, chat two things. One is a chapter that Nikki had written that's in the book Portraits of Jewish Learning. And it talks about the, the pass off between the, the kids learning decoding and the um, work with the tutors. And it's a great chapter. I recommend it to you if you can find that book. And I'm going to put also into the chat what I sent in the email to you so that if you didn't pull the, the notes, uh, <laughs> you can grab them if you want. Because what I want to do is talk about the, um, like to give you tactics that you can pass on to your teachers that help them work with decoding sound to print. As Nikki said, uh, we have a traditional way that we've been doing this. It's often kids breaking teeth. It's having them, you know, letter vowel sign letter vowel sign it's just painful sometimes but if they've learned the sounds of hebrew which includes especially the prayers then there are things your teachers can do differently in their uh work with them so i'm just going to kind of zip down here fill in some things i didn't want you to have to take too many notes um one of the most important things is to make sure that your teachers cue or if you are a teacher that you cue the prayer or blessing before you start working with it with decoding just as Nikki said, you know, kids have words, English words in their background, thousands of them before they start learning to read. She gave the cat example. Hebrew, they don't have that way, or it's this blur of, of sounds that just kind of go together. So if you have them, or if they don't know the, the prayer blessing yet that you're working on, the teacher does it, that you start by um, either singing or reciting or reading whatever your tradition is first, and not the whole prayer necessarily, but just work on a few lines at a time. And when you're done teaching, also do that. We do that with Hebrew through movement. We cue it up and then we review it at the end. That helps cement learning. Another thing is that you can cue via sound, um, meaning that you give them the sounds and then they have to find them rather than having them break their teeth again over whatever it is. So you can, have them hear them find so they can, you can give them a word or a phrase and they have to find the word, which means that you might be repeating it two or three times. They keep hearing it. They find it on the line. The teacher, the teen assistants, whoever walk around, see what kids are pointing to. And if need be, repeat it again, cue them on, in on a specific line, but make it a game, find the word. You can do a get in order activity where you blow up the words. It's like 150, 200 Point font, or if you want, you can get posters. There's a, a link here to the JEC's Teacher Center Shema and um, Amidah posters. They also have posters for other prayers and blessings, which you can cut up and use for this. Um, this is where you say, who has Yotzer or Vurei Choshech? And the kids look, you keep saying that phrase a few times, they see who has it. Only one person is going to really have the sound to print exactly. They get up in the front of the room and hold it. And then you add the next line and so on. So that, again, you're having them hear it slowly, carefully over and over again. And they're looking to see what's on the page. Um, there's another link here to a Hebrew through movement video where the it's all in Hebrew, but it's maybe a minute and 30 seconds. It's where the teacher is cueing the kids to get in line with Hamotzi. And you hear the number of times that she is saying each phrase, that's what you want to get to. You can use an app like JI Tap, which uh, I think is actually now branded with something different. But if you go to jitap.net, you'll see two different examples. One is from me. I did one on um, a vote to Imahot and one on Kiddusha. And kids hear, hear things, they have print on the page and they have to tap it. 
and then whatever that line or word is, and then they hear it repeated again, and then they hear the next thing they have to find. So it constantly gets them hearing and looking, and it can be done individually. And Ray Antonoff, I know that many of you know her work, she has a tefillah tap and hear whole set of segments in there. The page is a little busy if a kid has trouble with a busy page, not necessarily for them, but it has the Hebrew. It has a button that kids can tap, hear the, the, the Hebrew word either said or sung, or they can hear the whole line. So it's a way that you can work on a variety of prayers. You can use games. I talked about find and or hear and find, and you can do this with micro, just pieces of words, votenu, instead of avotenu, which has them looking in the middle and the end, or you could do macro with the full words and phrases. Um, you can play memory with them, you know, that card game where you have things that they have to turn over and see what matches. When I used to play that print to sound, I would have the kids read, read what they turned over. Here for doing sound to print, whoever's sitting with them, the teacher, um, a teen assistant, reads it first and then they read it back. Once they've hit it a couple times, they can do it. They can you know, read it the first time themselves, that's fine. There's also a very fun game called Zuzu, which you use with individual words. I will not explain to you how to play Zuzu. Right now, it's a form of upset the fruit basket. At the bottom of your page, you have a link to um, this teaching strategies resource, which is on our Onward Hebrew website. 16 pages, you can print it. It has all kinds of, of um, strategies for teachers to use, include, including the ones that I've told you, and it has Zuzu. Um, you can cue via print. Dr. Lifsa Schachter, who sits on my shoulder all the time, she's the one who helped me understand all of this, talks about, again, what Nikki said, that the letters in Hebrew are so similar, many of them. So you have the hey, the chet, the tub, oh wait, you turn it on its side and it's a bet and a cup, like it just, they're not as, an M and a K look very different. Those letters do not. Um, and so the more we can have kids look carefully at the, at the words and the letters that are in them, the easier it will be for them later. So she talks about dividing word into syllables, which in English, when we do this, we clap. So if I said the word engineer, I clap engineer, three claps, three syllables. Hebrew has a different set of rules for doing it. And we've learned not to call this dividing words into syllables, but to segment them because syllables just confuses kids. So there are three rules for segmenting. One is that every segment needs a vowel sign. The second rule is a shva, the two dots down, is not a vowel sign. It was put there just to tell you no vowel sign. And the chatak, which is what you see under the chatak vowels, which you see under the lamed, because they're a kind of shva, are also not considered a vowel sign. So you need to have a full vowel sign, a segol, a kamatz, katak, whatever it is, under each. And the example that I have given you is the Mishmaro Tehem. And if we were doing this where I were sharing screen and not giving you a page, I would have you work on this yourself, but we're not doing that. So if I were to clap this out, syllables, I'd end up with six claps. And indeed, when kids work to decode this, they're doing it very, <coughs> sorry, slowly and carefully. The Mishmaro Tehem. <coughs> but if we look to put one vowel sign in each segment, then you end up with Bamish Moro Tehem, Bamish Moro Tehem, which is the cadence of how we read Hebrew naturally. So if you can teach them how to do that, you can get the, um, you, you can help them also get the cadence and they're also learning to discriminate. There are two bullet points under here. Both of these come from, what you'll see at the bottom of the page, it says flash mob learning materials. Flash mob is where in a program here in Cleveland, uh, we taught the kids, we taught teens who were teen assistants how to teach sound to print, how to tutor sound to print. They would flash into a class, work with one or two kids at a time for 10 or 15 minutes, and then they'd flash out again and go to the next class. So they became experts in this. And in the resources that we have for them, which includes the lesson plans for how to teach them the skills, page 11 is the one on syllables, which is really about segmenting. And you can also see where a resource sheet is that you can use to give to kids. The final thing is um, make sure that learners know that they can use what's in their heads. It is not cheating for them to say, oh, I, I know that I, I can use that. They think that they have to keep decoding, which is painful along the way. So the example that I've given you is 
Osei Shalom. And that word that comes next looks a little confusing. Is that a holam in the middle? Is it above? In the, like, what do I do with it? But if, I, if the kid looks at it and goes, Osei Shalom, bim, oh, Bim Ramav, then those two things click in for them in a very different kind of a way. We often make gotcha kind of worksheets or reading sheets, which many of the publishers use, which means that the words are all out of order. I don't believe there's a reason for that other than if you really want them to painfully decode. But if you want them to take the sounds in their head and match to the print on the page, we should be doing more of that in order. Great. So I think we're going to transition into some Q&A and discussion. Um, Nahama and I tried to like throw a lot of thoughts and ideas and suggestions um, over these last maybe 25 minutes or so. Um, there have been a few questions that have come in in the chat. I've tried to answer um, them as I could. Um, but one of them was sent um, directly to me that I said I'd rather share um, uh, with the whole group, um, which is the question that was asked is, well, basically, like, why teach decoding if it's not for prayer participation? Um, like, then sort of what's the point? Um, which I, I love that question because I think it's a really important one for our communities to grapple with, um, that there's this default feeling that decoding is somehow like the single most important Jewish thing you should learn in religious school. And I would argue that's not really the case. I think it is a skill. It's not a bad skill to learn. It's a skill that we want to teach our kids, but it is not the most essential skill to participation in Jewish life. And I also think it's not the defining factor of whether you had a good Jewish education or not. So I think each community needs to wrestle with that question on its own. What is the value of knowing how to decode Hebrew or read Hebrew for a typical American Jew today? Um, what is the what world do you want to open up to them with this skill um, and where does it fit proportionally in your program in terms of sort of where does it rank in importance and therefore how much time should be devoted to it i say that because a lot of our programs have a huge percentage of time focused on decoding and i think the percentage of time is not in line with actually how important the skill is for a meaningful jewish life um, that being said, I'm not prepared to get rid of it. Um, I still think that it's a valuable skill. I think for me, I mean, I can answer just me personally, but again, I think this is a good question for your clergy, for your board, for your education committee, for your teachers. Like, it's something to think about. For me personally, I would say I think there is a feeling of insidery um, versus outsidery feeling, as you know, Jews feel like when they know the Hebrew, they can follow along in the Hebrew. They feel more like an insider. They feel like they have, you know, the secret code or something. Um, and that might be the only major reason I think it's useful to learn decoding because, again, I don't think it's the most important skill to be a, a meaningful, to have a meaningful prayer life. Um, and I also would say that even learning how to chant Torah, which, you know, most of our students do for B'nai Mitzvah, we know that, yes, they, in most of our communities, we want them to decode. And in many cases, we also teach them the cantillation, the trope. But at the end of the day, a lot of it is memorized auditorily. You know, you listen to your recording on your, um, you know, your phone or whatever platform we use these days. And you know, because there's no vowel signs, because there's no trope markings, you have to memorize it. Even when I'm learning, a, a, you know, how to chant a verses of Torah, I, I do, of course, learn it from the Hebrew and everything else. But at the end of the day, I do have to kind of memorize a fair amount of it in order to chant Torah. So I don't know that decoding is the key. We also all know of students, maybe students with special needs or for other reasons, that don't really ever get the hang of decoding and do learn how to chant Torah from transliteration or from an audio recording. And I don't think of them as any less Jewish or less, you know, important in Jewish life or anything like that. So I think that, um, again, I, I don't want you to walk away from this saying, well, we should just get rid of teaching decoding. I still think there is value in it. But I think that we have to think about, you know, what is the value? How much is it valuable in comparison to some other types of things we want to do with our students with the time that we have? And then how do we allocate the appropriate amount of time to learn this skill? So... Um, hopefully I didn't just make a lot of enemies, but, um, okay, there's some other things in the chat. Um, so have options. Some will go on to be Torah readers, others will be hollow bakers. I agree. I think that's a great, um, point to bring, to bring up that decoding is a piece of Jewish life and entryway into Jewish life, being able to read Hebrew. That is, you know, one of the ways into Jewish life. So certainly want to do that. Um, 
There's a question for just those on the call, so I'll let people answer in the chat. Are there other questions or things that you'd like to share with the whole group? Um, it can be in the chat. You can also raise your hand visually or with Zoom um, if you want to ask any questions of me or Nahama about that sound to print kind of approach with decoding or any of the things that I've shared. Uh, yes, Elizabeth. Would it be possible for you to share the assessment form that you used to measure confidence, competence, and attitude? Um, sure. I will have to figure out the best way to do that. I'll I'll work on it with Nahama. Um, Is that in your book chapter, maybe? Maybe. I'll have to look back. I don't remember what I shared there. Um, so we have, there's just, there's different types of resources. So we have a survey that we ask students, but that really is more about confidence and, and attitude. We don't do like a competence test for them in that way. Um, there was a time, it was actually all the way back in the era of the B'nai Mitzvah revolution, which some of you might remember or have been part of, um, we were collecting research on the change to our Hebrew program as part of our involvement in the B'nai Mitzvah revolution. And we created... Um, uh, there was an assessment that our B'nai Mitzvah tutor did when they um, started working with a student. So at that moment of transition to B'nai Mitzvah, they did, they had a, um, I don't know that I would say there's a lot to share other than they had a kind of like a spreadsheet or I think it was a scale of like one to five. They would sort of assess how strong a student is on different skills. Um, so they didn't have like a a test per se, but doing what they do when they have students read some things and chant some things and whatever, they would kind of assess students. Um, but I'm happy to share the student survey that we've done. And we also started to assess our teens from 8th through 12th grade because we were curious about the long-term um, outcomes or longer-term outcomes. However, we put had to put a pause on that during COVID because we were doing it as part of a teen program that was here at our congregation. And anyway, it's a long story, but we haven't done it in the last two, three years. But I have that document, which I'm happy to share as well. I'm, I'm mostly interested in the excuse me, confidence and attitude ah, as, we're, as we're moving toward adapting uh, or adopting um, onward Hebrew and Hebrew through motion. Um, I'd love to do that survey before we get too far along in the program. Like you said, you didn't have the before answers. Yeah. I'd like to get the before answers before we start. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm happy to share it. I have a sort of a, a survey that we used for many years and you're welcome to use it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Andrea asked, what resources for auditory Hebrew exposure do we supply or expect families to utilize at home? I, I, sometimes I say this and I, I don't know if it's like setting a bad example, but in some ways I don't expect the students to get a lot of Hebrew input at home. I think we are... Um, we are doing our best to create these opportunities in community and we do, you know, send some resources home sometimes, but I don't expect they're going to hear much Hebrew at home. So therefore, we try to do as much as we can when they're in community, um, whether that's at JQuest or at our youth group events or at Shabbat programming or at other things. We're thinking about what are the auditory Hebrew experiences they're getting there because I don't think they'll have much at home. We do try to, I'm working on a Spotify playlist with, you know, Jewish music, Hebrew songs. Um, we've given out a Hebrew letter placemat to some of our youngest students to just, again, have that at home. Um, but that's visual, obviously, not auditory. Um, but I don't expect that they have a whole lot of auditory input at home other than maybe music. Um, there was a question, do I share Jewish life vocabulary with families? Yeah, so today's webinar isn't as focused on the, the piece of Onward Hebrew that's called Jewish life vocabulary, but it's relevant because we do want to, them to be exposed to the print Hebrew, to the Hebrew letters, the alphabet, words in Hebrew from a young age. <clears throat> and so the way we do that in my congregation is that every week we have a Hebrew letter of the week, and then there's words, Jewish life vocabulary words that are connected with that letter. And I think of it more like Sesame Street than, you know, it's not an hour long lesson on the letter bet and like, you know, the word bavakasha, but it's kind of like Sesame Street where like it's sort of in in the water, so to speak, in different ways. Um, <clears throat> so we create that each year of which letter and which words are for which weeks. And yes, we share that out with the families um, in two or three different ways. It goes out in our weekly email of what the letter and the words of the week are so that the families know that. It also goes out as a whole document of like, this is what we're doing and this is the schedule. Uh, we send that out with our um, 
uh, kind of year-end reports at the end of the year of like, here's what we did. Um, and we also send it out um, in the middle of the year as a whole a whole document. Along with at the mid-year and end year, we also send a document with all of the words that they did for Hebrew through movement uh, across the different ages. Because we want the parents to see all the Hebrew that they're learning because they are learning a bunch of Hebrew. Um, is it possible to give us an example of one letter you send one week? Like what it says in our newsletter? Sure, I'm happy to pass that along. I will say that others actually are even way more creative than I've been with um, how to share letter of the week and things like that. So uh, Nahama probably has good resources for that. Yeah, in um, the on, I'll look for, there's like a thing in Onward Hebrew, which gives examples of what you can do that. I'll put it in the chat. Perfect. So we're getting near near the end and um, we, we're going to, switch into breakout rooms, but we don't have time, so we're not going to do that. But we would love for you to take a minute to think about what is something from today that you are hoping to continue to think about. Um, you may also have been taking notes on what you might want to start, what you might want to stop. Um, but if you can share in the chat, what is something that you will continue to think about after today? Um, that would be great. And uh, a little bit of multitasking. While you do that, I'm going to... Um, maybe say a few words of um, next steps. Uh, there is another webinar coming up that's offered through um, Onward Hebrew that is coming up on August 11th next week, same time. Um, that one is gonna really focus on Jewish life vocabulary. The facilitator is Sue Boyduck. And um, the E3, the educator with experience and expertise that's gonna be joining is Randy Bischoff. So that'll be a really great um, webinar to be part of. And uh, before you jump off, I want to wrap up with a comment about goals and measuring success that um, the cantor that I work with and I have been talking a lot about recently, especially with some of the changes with COVID and, you know, decoding and where are we spending our time and energy. And I think it's we really have to work with our stakeholders, with our lay leaders, our teachers, our you know board members, our clergy, our you know whoever all the stakeholders are, to think about what are our goals as it relates to Hebrew. And particularly when it comes to decoding, what does, getting back to what I said earlier, why are we teaching decoding? What is its value? What are we hoping to accomplish with it? And how does that relate to how we're spending our time? Because if one of the main goals is prayer and prayer participation, Decoding is just not necessarily the way into that or the only way into that. And so, um, you know, how do we support learning to read Hebrew, but also support all these other goals that we have in Jewish education? And how do we make time and space for all the other things we want to do by sort of putting decoding in its rightful place, which is not, you know, all of it or 75% of the time they're there. Um, so thinking through how we best use our time and try to accomplish the goals that we set out for ourselves is something that I would encourage everyone to uh, to kind of wrestle with and share with your the other people that you work with as well. Any other thoughts, Nahama, or things you want to add? No, I, you've done you've done well, Nikki. Thank you very <laughs> much on behalf of us all in facilitating and offering your ideas. I often quote you, and. Uh, Nikki has shown the way for many of us as to how this can happen because she was early into implementing. So thank you very much. So thank you, everybody. Miraculously, we ended two minutes early. That never happens in webinars. Um, so you're welcome to stay and add a question or two, or if you want to jump off, uh, thank you for coming today. And, um, you know, chazak, chazak, v'nit chazak. May we be strong and strengthen and strengthen one another. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.